Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Focus, coming to you from Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and here in the studio I have my very welcome guests, who are Donna Bister and Mark Estrin, the publishers from Fomite Press. And the title for our program is Leaning In with Fomite Press. So thank you very much for coming into the studio today. You're right in Burlington. You are the publishing house in Burlington. Mm, for my is that press. true? We're one of the publishing houses in Burlington. Okay. Yeah, there are a few okay. publishers in Burlington. All right. Well, but we're the major publishing house. Major publishing <laughs> No, I mean, in terms of size, because... Uh, in terms of output, maybe not yeah, size. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this got out of hand very quickly in terms of size. Okay. Well, what, is, what does? Why did you choose the name Fomite Press for, yeah. to begin with? I had a, a I had written a novel, I think, in two thousand seven or something like that, in which uh, um, there was a fake press, a fictive press that had mm -hmm. published a book that's part of the novel, right, and. Um, we needed a name for the press, for the fake press. The novel is called The Annotated Nose, and The Nose is this fictive novel uh, which the book is about. Uh, and we didn't, you know, what's the name of a press? So I think it was my daughter, who was a doctor, who suggested Fomite. And we didn't really know what Fomite was, and she says, well, you know, it's, it's, and then it seemed perfect. A Fomite is a surface on which, from which uh, microorganisms can be transferred. So, like, this is a fomite. Mm -hmm. This is a fomite. <laughs> this is a fomite. <laughs> right. And, and the, the uh, extension to books is that uh, books are fomite for psychic microorganisms to be passed from one person to another. Ideas, stories. Right. Yeah. And then we had this great um, Tolstoy quote that, you know, subsequently we found. He says, uh, the activity of art is based on the capacity of people to be infected by the feelings of others. <sighs> so, you know, it all kind of worked out. So then there was the, this press, and we had a name for the press. When we decided to make a press, we had a name for it out of this comedy book about a fake press. <laughs> so... When when was that? When was was uh, for my press? Two thousand and eleven, yeah. and it grew out of a, a writers group that Mark participates in. That's been going on for many many years in Burlington, and Mark would come home and say that book really needs to be published. And at the time, um, print on demand publishing was kind of just getting started in a big way, and so we decided we would try it. Um, and Ron Jacobs, who's a local librarian, activist, writer, said, well, I have a novel. You could use that for an experiment. So we laid it out, set it up, sent it away, and it came back and looked pretty good. <laughs> um, so That's wonderful. That's the first novel, then, that right. you, you for my press. It was sort of the experimental novel. It, 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 we, we didn't even really, we weren't even sure we were going to, have a press. We were just mm -hmm. trying to see what would happen if, um, if we if went we, the process. If we applied self-publishing kind of um, procedures to someone's book. And this was at the time when, in some bookstores, there were printing presses there. Exactly. At that time, and were there? Did you use somebody local here, or did you send it away to some other publishing? We sent it away to the um, evil corporation Amazon because they had the easiest interface for us to use and the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. So with that um, system, there was no cost to us at at all until a book is printed. Um, now. Eight years later, we've moved much of our work over to Ingram Spark, which is the printing side of Ingram Books, which is a wholesaler that supplies mostly independent bookstores. So we're getting away from that early um, focus on Amazon to being more like a 
a right. regular press in some ways. And what was the reaction to this first publication? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> and, and it wasn't Ron's book. That wasn't the first book. Yes, it was. It was? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but but um, it didn't matter. Mm. And uh, what mattered to us was that it, it looked like a real book, you know, mm. and it was sort of beautiful. And you could flip through the pages and, you know, it had And it looked normal. It, it looked normal. It didn't look like, it looked like any, any other book you would pick up in Crow, the, for Because there, the, there, you know, in the early days of this stuff, there was stuff that really looked do-it-yourself, DIY. Mm -hmm. And this didn't look DIY at all. It looked like a real book. And we thought, well, you know, this has possibilities uh, that won't offend our aesthetic uh, tastes. Although the problem of doing it with Amazon has been present as kind of our original sin from the beginning, mm -hmm. because we uh, are trying to do this in a, in a quote business model uh, that is different from normal publishing. Um, and our business model is not to make any money. For the press. For us or for the press. Uh, and this is a rather complex issue because at the same time we want maximum exposure for our authors. Right, right. So, and, uh, and also you want, the, the authors want some recompense also. Yeah, and okay. the split is, is very dramatic. It's 20% for you, for all the costs that mm -hmm. you have, and 80% for the, the writer. It is, and normally it's 10% for the writer and 90% divided between bookstores mm -hmm. and the publishers. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we wanted to flip around. Um, and uh, so we have a model that comes from our long history, both of us, with Bread and Puppet, mm -hmm. which is to not be worried about money, uh, to you know, be outside of the cash nexus and sort of outside of getting reviews and outside, just mm -hmm. outside of everything, and that the quality and importance of the work would in itself uh, be like an icebreaker in this big mm. field of uh, too much, the field of too much. Mm. And you're not swimming as you're, you're just <laughs> articulating like that to the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is locked, right? As there, far as what publishing is the world. What is the Garden of Eden? Well, about getting locked out of the uh, where you would need money and that sort of thing. So, I mean, these are facts that once we're out of the Garden of Eden, as, as the biblical text, the I published think we're in the text. Garden of Eden. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is too amazing. I mean, no, seriously. <laughs> so, What's more Garden of Eden? Um, um, a, a, a big capital a bank uh, a complex, uh, Northrop Grumman or <laughs> Lockheed or Bread and Puppet. And so we, we can choose books to publish because we think they're great books or we like the message. We don't have to worry about whether or not that book is going to sell enough copies to make its cost. Right, right. Yeah. Um, because there are no costs until a book is printed and sold. So. That's what's amazing. We can bring out a book that's this size. You know, this is a medium-sized novel. And we'll, and we can talk about this book later. Yeah. And in fact, each of these things. Uh, for the cost of our time, which well, is no, it's free. nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. No, I mean it will cost us out of pocket what thirty five dollars or something at the most. Yeah, and you know you think of oh, it's publishing so expensive. It's not expensive. It's free basically if you want to contribute your time and your software and your machines and your interests and your background and your history and your uh, critical skills. It's free. And Bread and Puppet has <coughs> a very similar kind of uh, relationship to costs. Well, could you elucidate us on Bread and Puppet? Because a lot of us uh, viewers are ignorant of what Bread and Puppet is. It burst upon the scene in America in the 60s, as far as I know. Right. 
in, in the in the great uh, protests against the Vietnam War. The, the puppets were there. And also they were at Theater for the New City in New York City. That's where I saw their first uh, productions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the guiding principle of bread and puppet that we've used in, in um, publishing is, that, is the cheap art principle, mm. which is art, art is like bread, art, is, art feeds the soul, art shouldn't be... Um, for museums and for, banks. For museums and banks, it, shouldn't, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And so we've chosen to make our work on the, based on that same principle. Um, and, 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 you know, what is, what are the salaries of the resident puppeteers is $100 a week or something like they that. They got a raise to 125 I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the puppeteers themselves, obviously inc including Peter Schumann, the director, and his wife, uh, Elka, who does every task you can't even think of, uh, are basically nothing. Our salaries are literally nothing. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you don't use your art or your politics to make money, personal money, is, is uh, what's is our version of cheap art. And it's also um, drawn us to do a lot of work with Bread and Puppet Theater and publishing um, in book form things that Peter has made in pamphlet form, usually. Do you have uh, one of those here well, now? We have a few, a few different things. I mean, this has been a, a, a recent adventure. Here's the, the latest book. I don't know if you can see this. It's called A Child's Deprimer. And, um, you know, it looks like this inside. It's all lessons for the thinking child. <laughs> right. And, you know, the texts are... Uh, um, uh, or Peter Schu this just says, I just opened it, when the holes get treated at the hospital, the adult world's diagnosed with heart disease. You know, so, and uh, these texts are just great and crazy and profound, uh, as is usually the case with stuff that Peter writes. We have a whole, um, Peter has a whole bunch of possibilitarian books. Um, this book is called from the possibilitarian arsenal of belligerent and not so belligerent slogans. So that title is very bread and puppety, Peter Schumann. And again, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, drawings and, and uh, pages and things like that. Uh, so these are a great deal of fun to publish. Two diagonal man books. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so. Working with Peter, actually, there's a book that's not here, which is not like this. This book, We, is is like this, is, you know, is uh, kind of drawings. and But we have a book that is mostly print, which um, was an attempt to get into, to poke no little tiny noses and feet into the vast library of notebooks that Peter has kept, sketches and ideas and laundry lists and, and uh, to-dos and, you know, uh, and they're, half, they're about a third in German and um, they're quite illegible. But there's so much stuff in there that's of value. And so we extracted 608 um, little paragraphs, and it's called Bread and Sentences. And it's a very, very um, privileged angle of sight into the mind, brain, soul of Peter Schumann, because these kind of books are not. You know, this is the presentational self. This is the political image. Are, is this, are these actually from diaries that he kept? They're from not his, diaries. His they're, they're just things he writes down, oh, you know. So he's, whenever, whenever he walks around, he has a notebook and he's always scribbling in an idea for a change in a show or what he needs to do this afternoon or could be anything. 
and losing the notebooks. Where's my, anybody see my notebook? <laughs> now you mentioned some, most, a lot of it is in German and, he, and Peter Schumann was born in Germany. Yeah. He ca and he came here, was it East or West Germany at that time? In East Germany. East okay. Germany. And he came here, well, I only- Silesia, was it, actually. Was, yeah. was, was, Silesia. Silesia, yeah, which yes. is near Poland. It was, in, you know, it's changed Polish, German, Polish, German. Yes, right? yes, ping ponging back and forth. But uh, Peter Schumann came here and became a, a well-known artist in the '60s. Isn't mm -hmm. that so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the theater has def defied all rules of theater, and it's the only theater from the '60s that's still not only around, but you know, alive and kicking hard. Right, and it was conceived as a political theater. Yes. Is that so? Yes, and it right. is. Yeah. yeah. And it stayed so, that way. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's part of what we're doing. And, you know, we could do a whole show on Bret and Puppet. We, yeah. Both of us spent a lot of time. But another way that Bret and Puppet has influenced us in publishing is that many of our books have a political message or they're commenting on the current political situation or um, talking about some political history. For example, this little book of poetry is called Little Steel, and it's about the Little Steel strike in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and the author, Sudi Burton from Burlington, her family was involved in that. And um, it's an important piece of labor history. Mm -hmm. And here it is in a beautiful, tiny little book. The same with. Yeah. And I mean, here's a similar thing. This is the shirtwaist fire. Um, you, you may you know about that. Right? Yes, yes, yes. So all of these young women who were locked up in the building were killed in, in this fire because the door was locked because the owner didn't want um, the women to be um, taking stuff out of the factory or taking breaks or whatever. And um, De Delia Bell. Uh, has made a book of two very different types of drawings. Uh, one is a comic, sort of comic book stuff, and the other is are these drawings of the time, the people at the time. It's a gorgeous book uh, mm -hmm. called A Shirtwaist Story. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it, it brings this issue of, of job exploitation and not only in American history, but uh, currently, you know. Yeah. And this was the beginning, at the beginning of the 20th century, wasn't yes. it? The, yes. This was the shirtwaist uh, fire. Yes. The triangle was it mentioned. Triangle shirtwaist factory uh, and, is what it was called. And was it? It was the Triangle Building right down there near City Hall in New York City, yes. Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And the terrible loss of life in yes. the women who were locked in that building. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very political, but also preser preser historical. In, in well, and the two that. stories are interwoven. So one is the story of the the immigrants who were working in the factory, and the other is the story of the family that owned the factory. Mm -hmm. um, and so it brings those two stories together. The grandson of the owner lives in Montpelier, mm. uh, sighting distance. Dee 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 can see his house from her house. <laughs> oh my goodness. And she, uh, for many years, was thinking he, she'd like to talk to him about this story. You know, what's it like to be mm. a shirtwaist guy? And uh, eventually he, he said, OK, and he told her this story, and she wrote it down uh, and made drawings, you know, of Peter's story. It's different Peter, yeah. but, um, and that's what these are. And does does this book go into the forming of labor unions then? No, this no. book is about this story. Yeah, and about the tragedy. Yes, yeah. about the tragedy and about the effect of being related to, having people in your family who are responsible for that. So um, I think it has some contemporary, um, it, it, the same things are happening today. Yes, I mean, people, yes, yeah. people are doing things that are similar on both sides. 
you know, right. there, are, there are people who o still own um, sweatshops. Um, I know. We, it's, we it's could talk about Amazon um, um, warehouses in the yeah. same way, you know, in the same way. So, um. so the, you know, one of the questions that faced us early on, okay, someone should publish it, someone should publish this, why, I mean, why don't we publish it, let's try it, blah, blah, blah. there we are. But then, who reads? You know, the people that are in the workshop, not it's not a workshop, it's just a reading group um, that I'm in, don't publish because they think publishing is, um, is an inverse chic. If you're published, you know, you're already garbage, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, the question of, of printed text in this culture, why would we go into, why would we make novels like, you know, a fat novel like this, right? Mm. Who would read it? Nobody. That's, the, that's my last novel. Um, Kafka's Roach by Mark Estrin. So who would read it? The answer is nobody. Um, even though it's a fabulous book, I have to say. I mean, it really is. It's a history, of detailed history of U.S. Um, death wish from 1915 to 1945. It's a detailed history of the Manhattan Project. It's a detailed history of the nuclear. It's not a history. I mean, it's as told by a friend of a six-foot talking cockroach, right? Mm -hmm. Who was uh, Gregor Zamsuk uh, from Kafka, and so you know, it's a novel. There's a lot of funny things in it, but and but it's it's terrifically critical uh, insight into how these stuff one develops from the other and you wind up with the atomic bomb. Uh, so, you know, in a way it's ridiculous, waste of my time to write a book like that and waste of Fulmite's time to publish it. But it has, it has political content. This, this came, this is a really interesting book about a, a real community in New Jersey, now, current, currently, that was built on a hill at the bottom of which, uh, it, go, going into the, the bay there, uh, was f a Ford motor plant. And Ford um, took all of its old paint and buried it, buried the paint in tunnels up the hill where these people are living. And that paint has gotten into the soil and the food and the air. And you have this whole poisoned community living on the hill above the Ford plant with these tunnels. And this is a, a book that takes place uh, in that community. And when the people are dealing with this ongoing poisoning, you know. Well, and New that, Jersey is a, is a uh, haven for such like communities going right. way back to the last century. But the, so so this is a novel about yeah. that. How many novels do you have about it? You don't. So, uh, and uh, that's, that's a novel about the corruption of the New York Police Department and its uh, interaction with the press, you know, uh, and derail this train wreck. Mm -hmm. um, so all of this stuff has real political content. You want to talk about this? or? Well, I, I thought maybe we should talk about the pamphlets next. Yeah, well, when Trump got into reality, I don't mean when he was elected, I mean when all of a sudden it appeared as if this joke had potential serious consequences. Mm -hmm. So during the um, pre-election stuff, we thought, well, you know, it's one thing to put detailed, deep analysis into big, fat books that no one's going to read. We should do something that's a little more uh, available. So, um, we decided to do a series of shorter um, pamphlets, um, tracts, which are, what, 6,000 words? So, yeah. so they're longer than a 
three-fold um, brochure, but mm -hmm. they're not as long as a book. And uh, we, we made a template for them, so they're very quick and easy to publish. Mm -hmm. um, however, mostly we don't sell them as printed um, pamphlets. We sell them as, we sell them as free ebook downloads for people. Um, and the, they cover a lot of contemporary topics. Um, yeah, I can just read through. They, they each have on the back this saying, this uh, quote from Gramsci, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Each of them have that on the back. And this is uh, Theater Mundi, the theater of the world. This is a, called Riot. This is called Conspiracy, a, th a Philosophical Defense. This is called Art, Post-Truth, Masculinity, Three Warnings, Palestine Path, Marx, Capitalism, Waste, Reality. It's questions about reality. And so, and there are a few more actually that are not in this pile. So how does it get to be free? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> no, it's it's a good, it yeah. Well, because in in the world of online publishing, um, it's it's actually pretty common to make samples of eBooks available for free, or um, you know, online downloads from somewhere to be free, and mm -hmm. it just works out for us that we can make it available that way. Um, once we've done the the layout and the preparation for the print version, it's really simple to make it um, not cost anything. And electrons don't cost very much. Yeah, but pe but pe people who sell it charge for electrons, right? They can. They don't have to. Well, what, who doesn't and why? Well, I think um, who doesn't are people like us. And um, these actually get a fair number of downloads every month. Um, which was a little bit surprising to us because we haven't done a, a really a lot to promote them other than a little bit on our website and um, occasional other uh, things like that. But um, I lost my train of thought. But it's not just people like us, you know. I, I thought like Kobo and uh, not Kindle but um, Nook and mm -hmm. all of those big, big people do it for nothing. They do some things for nothing. And why do they do our things for nothing? Because we're not asking them for anything except a little space on their website. Really? Um, I think it's, it's primarily to get people to use the devices and to read, read that way. So, um, Although, uh, theoretically, you are against like, e-books. You would want people to read the, the actual book. To, to smell the book, to experience the weight of the book in your I don't, hands. I don't think we're against e-books. Yeah. You're not against e-books. We're e not against e-books. No. Um, they're not as beautiful. They're not tangible. They're not really objects. But um, e-books have some advantages for some folks. One, for example, I travel a fair amount, and I always used to bring three, four, five books with me. They're heavy. Yeah. And then I have to do something with them when I'm finished with them. Um, so it's an advantage to me to be able to read that way. Um, Mark likes to be able to make the type a little bit bigger. So in a book like this, the type size is fixed. And that's not so easy for people who don't see well or whose eyes get tired or um, something like that. So. Um, and we, you, your assumption is correct. We started out with a big chip on our shoulders about how oh, that's for you, books, you know, right? And then we thought, okay, but you know, the authors would like to have their books out there, and so maybe we should see. Oh, we can do e-books for practically nothing. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, and so we ordered a Nook and a Kindle. Just to see. Just to yeah. see what the books would look yeah. like after we've done the, done the um, uh, formatting for them. 
And, you know, first of all, they looked great. And second of all, we discovered our bookshelves, which is every single square inch of our house, were too full to put any new books in. Yeah. And third of all, this is a great one to illustrate, when you're lying in bed at night and it's cold, and you just you know, want to have one hand under the cover, and just reach up, and you're lying there, and you want, it, and you're going like this, and and then the print is too small. Okay, so you make the print bigger, and then how do you turn the page without taking your other arm out from under the covers? It's it's impossible. And whereas with an, an e-book reader, you just go like this, you know, and you touch the screen, so. I have to say that I haven't bought a book in two years. A book book. Bad boy. A, a what? Bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that we we're able to do through through print on demand publishing is to connect the print book and the ebook. So if someone buys a printed copy of this, they can download the ebook for free. Yes. So they're not it's not either or necessarily right. it, and but and that's both also and. not available to every book that you buy every hardcover book that you buy right. is not accessible by ebook too so it's yeah. very good that you make it accessible right and what's what's free on ebooks are the great books yes and yeah. what's terrific on them is if you're reading in foreign languages and you need a word you just tap on it and you get the translation. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> furthermore, I mean, this is a great, these are great machines. They're really well thought out and well designed. If, furthermore, if you, you know, you read a book and you, and you, you, out, you put a line next to it on the, the, that's called highlighting. So if you do that on the e screen, you've highlighted that text, okay and you want to use that in scholarly work or to quote it, mm -hmm. it already exists as a file. You don't have to type it in. It's there. You can just cut and paste it. So all that I'm saying is that w at least I am an ebook fanboy, even though <laughs> I, I don't write ebooks, I write these right. books. Right. Well, I picture the vast number of holdouts from the ebooks of friends of mine who uh, will not read the ebooks no matter what their age, you know, whether they're mm -hmm. very old or very young. And uh, it's their they, problem. they do all the research <laughs> and they have all the little yellow stickers in there. And, but there's a uh, completion about a, uh, having the book in front of you and holding it like this and, and a tactile and uh, uh, all kinds of. Uh, of satisfaction that comes from holding the actual book. Books are beautiful objects. Yum. Yum. And, um, and that's what we make. And that's what we try, we try to make. But, um, but could you go into, like you, this is, Fomite is a post-capitalist operation. Nah. No, you don't want to do that? No, 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 we can go into it. I mean, that's what we originally thought. And for instance, that is certainly true of Bread and Puppet as, as it exists in totality. Mm. I mean, they work with cardboard, they don't do, wait for theater reviews, they don't do advertising. And that was one of the reasons why they, they were originally in, in Manhattan, in New York City. They were originally living there in the Lower East Side yeah. and producing their plays right there, but then, then they disappeared to Vermont. Well, that's another story, <laughs> and we can talk about yeah. that if we have time. But the thing is that if the, if you start out in bed with Amazon, and we're trying to get out of the bed, mm. or at least have one foot out of the bed, yeah. you know. But the fact is that Amazon, the Amazon structure handles these books optimally. And it puts it on the website, and a week later there's a look inside uh, thing, so you can actually read the, you know, the first 50 pages of this book and see if you want it that uh, it's horrible, but it is the case that doing this with Amazon uh, contradicted our needs, yeah. but fulfilled our needs, or the author's needs anyway. Yeah. And there's also, the, that's the way the society is, but yet being a, a bread and puppet, uh, 
you try to live outside that as much as possible. You, you, you try to live outside it. But even, you know, to say this is an, an anti-capitalist press, we, we started with that idea, but it, it doesn't make, it doesn't... It Does, doesn't exactly work that way, yeah. much as we would like it to. And the only thing that we can say about it that is sort of pure is that we don't take money. Mm. You know? mm. And um, we don't, the press doesn't take money. We don't, if we did take money, we would, if, if the balance, right now we're pretty much on the line. We're not in the black, mm. we're not in the red. You know, we're just about on the line. If it changed, we would change our policies to continue our n no money making. So that in itself is not uh, is not ca a capitalist idea, mm -hmm. obviously. Well, what do you want today? Like, if there are writers out here, and all around the world now <laughs> to come to for my press. And they do, yeah. Yes, and they do, and but. Uh, Sometimes you have a red light on your website that, that people can't get in because you're not accepting manuscripts right now. And a green light means that you are. And what is, what's the deciding factor in that? Whether you let people in or whether, can anybody approach you and would you say, yes, I'll, our doors are open? No, certainly not. Well, whether or not the, red, red, the light is red or green has to do with how many manuscripts we have waiting for production. Okay. So right now we have about, I would say we have 20 books that are in some state they, of production. They, they've been accepted. They've been I've accepted. accepted them and I have worked with the author back and forth uh, enough times to have sent to Donna a manuscript that says, final one. Okay. Right. So I send it over to Donna. That means it's in production. And what is the criteria, or do you have a criteria for accepting a manuscript? What he likes is what you like. Okay. Yeah, and that's problematical because my particular tastes are, you know, who are my, my, my greats? Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Thomas Mann and, and uh, okay, Pynchon and Gaddis and, and uh, you know, like I, I like hard, complicated texts mm -hmm. uh, because they're very interesting. They're more interesting. They send me off to do research. So uh, my tastes, if I were to, to do my tastes, only, we would have zero books. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's some stretching about, you know, what's good, even if it's not Dostoevsky. <laughs> right. Well, and there's certain things we don't do even if they are good. So we don't publish memoirs or nonfiction generally or children's books. Um, or straight genre fiction. Some of those because they have pretty good markets somewhere else and it's not necessary, and some because we just couldn't do it. Mm. Either um, physically couldn't do it, children's books are really hard, um, or because we're not interested. So, Or because it's too, too hard. For instance, we, we learned early on because a puppeteer actually gave me her memoir. Mm. And, you know, it's sort of, sort of interesting. But you know, I tried to talk to her the way editors talk to, you know, how about we cut this out or this should go here. And, and you can't mess around with people's lives. That isn't how it happened, she said. Mm. Mm. And uh, so I realized that doing memoirs is... It's dangerous. Dangerous. Mm. You know. And plus everybody's memoir, I mean, people are publishing their memoirs like this, especially if their father was a priest with whom they had incest. Oh, yeah. okay. But and, I think the other polio. thing is a, a mm. lot of things that we choose to publish either have some political content, um, they're things that would be hard to get published in the current um, publishing world, um, they're just interesting to us. We're, we're working now on our fourth book, I think, from a Bulgarian writer who 
her writing is just like nothing you've ever seen <laughs> here. Um, and so we liked the first group of stories that we, she sent, and now we're working on her third novel. Um, but why? Why the political thrust? Why? It, because it somehow is narrowing, isn't it? Is it not if it's political? Is it, does it have to be political in your eyes? Is that part of your selection process? Uh, I don't think it's a, a, it's a positive. It's not it's, a deal it's breaker. It's a positive. It's yeah. not a deal yeah. breaker. Although, um, I don't know if it's a deal breaker or not. I mean, I think I, think I get interested, obviously, if it's, it's a topic of relevance. Mm -hmm. And then the question of what's relevant has to do with what's politically relevant, what's psychologically relevant, uh, culturally relevant, and all of that. So, uh, I, I, you know, in some way, that's all political. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't publish la-di-da books. <laughs> and, <laughs> and even if, even if there's a, a lot of political content, it still has to be well-written and yeah. a coherent story. And, uh, because, as say, Dostoevsky is so political. He is political in everything that he writes, and yet he doesn't... It's because it's in his whole being. It, it's his, in his metabolism. It's the way he breathes and, and uh, goes about his business that, that is political. And, and it works, you know, a century later, or however much longer later, more than a century later. But uh, so what is political to you, Mark? What is, what is political? Is it something that is an exi I think existential po political word? is a subspecies of important and relevant to me, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, for instance, we have this big novel um, about the, the plot is this guy's father disappeared, uh, walked through Checkpoint Charlie in the, during the war and never came back. What ha and then he goes out to search for his father. And um, it's a huge book, what, 1,300 pages or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, it's basically about searching for uh, two, uh, about two anthropologists, uh, uh, linguists, on either side of the uh, political divide, both going out to, f to try to, translate, to find and translate, a, uh, break a code of this um, ancient Mycenaean language. You know, uh, you learn about how CIA guys are brought up. You learn about the generals in Greece. You know the whole generals thing. And speaking of generals, I mean, you would tell them about Theodorakis. You know. Well, we, we're about to publish um, a dual language uh, book of, of the um, song lyrics and poetry of Mikos Theodorakis, who was um, so involved in, in the um, protests against the Greek generals. Um, I don't know what else to say about him. Well, if these things haven't been published. The author is a professor of Greek at Cornell who played as a young woman in Theodorakis's band, right? Oh. And this is when, like, they were on the hit list to be killed. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. so and so she's had this lifelong uh, relationship with Theodorakis, and um, has access to all of his stuff, and and a lot of his stuff has not been published. Like his, so I mean, he's a great poet. His songs and poetry have not been published, and we got the first crack at him because we we know Gail and we've published some other poems of hers, and so now we're bringing out. Um, the, in dual language, you know, left, right, left page, right page. We have quite a few of those. Um, I think an important book. So G Gail, and what is her last name? She's written this book. Hulse right. Warhaft. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She has made available and translated these texts and given, given us pages of her, his manuscript, you know, on, on music paper, where he's writing the notes of the songs. So. And he, he wrote a little preface to the book. Mm -hmm. So that should come out probably in the next month or so. Someone 
other than us is uh, proofreading the Greek. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. But, but Thedorakis is no longer alive. No, he's still alive. Is he still alive? Mm -hmm. Yes, he's in his 90s. We have some great pictures of them. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> How wonderful. It brings to mind the first things I did in theater, which was with the Ancient Drama Company in New York City. And the, the director was Paul Nord, and his this leading lady, this was for Hecuba, was Aliki Nord. And they were uh, refugees from Greece at that time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, with, and they were political also. They had been tortured by the Nazis in, in Greece mm -hmm. at, during the war. And, Aliki Nord had lost her infant from the Nazis, and so that they did the, these great Greek tragedies in New York City mm -hmm. at that time. So. We also, by the way, this sounds all very serious, which it is, often, but we also do crazy books. Okay. And uh, the, oh, we should have brought some crazy books. Yeah, we well, did. tell us about them then. No. So well, the book, basically, they, they're called odd, we call them odd birds. That's a category, odd birds. And they don't fit into the, the general, like, this is fiction and this is poetry and this, you know, uh, fiction, poetry, short stories. These are books that are, whose content don't, won't fit, right? And one of them, for instance, is a, a book of beautiful uh, drawings by Doug Knapp, whom a lot of people around here know. It's called Artsy Fartsy. And uh, Artsy Fartsy is uh, just a bunch of encounters, one face at a time with text under it, of the kind of idiotic things that people say to him as they're buying his art, <laughs> right? including me. Right, I'm in there. I and his it. mother. And his mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's been, a, and, and, and then, you know, Peter's books are uh, odd birds, too, because, you know, it, that's, that's not what <laughs> you expect in a book, right? And, and um, a lot of those books uh, are in more interesting uh, page-making and uh, design problems, then, you know, if the, this book is very big, but it's basically you throw the text into a template, and it, it comes out like that, right? and then you have to check little things, but uh, but the, this is not in a template. In fact, we they would, Amazon wouldn't do this, mm -hmm. and we had to find another printer to do it, because it's they don't have this size paper. <laughs> and they also, like, some of the paintings are on... Uh, yeah. Over the yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a book about refugees, about the refugee crisis, mm. and it's some of it is painted on a Pew um, organization report about refugees, oh. yeah. and Amazon felt that the text was obscured and that people might complain, so they wouldn't print it. They complained they couldn't read the text oh. on, on which these were painted. Over which these were painted. They didn't complain about Didi's about the, about this, you know, because Didi took a book uh, and wrote over it and painted over it. Somehow this got passed. <laughs> and what about these Industrial Oz books? So, these are especially relevant today because of the big Extinction Rebellion um, protests that are going on. Scott Starbuck writes what he calls eco poems. So they're poems about, um, you know, all of the ecological issues and disasters in the world. Um, we have three of his books and a, a fourth one possibly to come. Um, and he draws his inspiration just partly from his own interaction with the nat natural world, but also from newspaper headlines and things he hears about. Um, and is a series? Is it a series? Uh, not or exactly a series. Um, you'd know it was the same poet. You'd know yeah. it was the same poet. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's uh, different artists. I just came across why all U.S. made nuclear waste must be stored at the White House. <laughs> oh, this is, this, I'll read this on my nuclear shows. So, okay. this is amazing. Yeah. And, and what's also amazing is the cover of this book, 
here. Let's see if I can see it here. I think you're, you're um, at the wrong camera. It's over camera. this way. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. You can see it. Um, Donna and I were at a, uh, I don't know. A, New Year's Eve party or something. Yeah, maybe some kind of party at one of our author's house. And uh, this uh, a woman had uh, brought her little kids to the party. It was the late afternoon, it wasn't yeah. there. And so this, this little girl is, is sitting at the table playing with clay. And um, she made this, this is a five-year-old, right? made this um, sculpture. And Donna and I had just passed by it, and I said to Donna, that's a great book cover, <laughs> <laughs> that sculpture. So, so uh, Donna took a picture of it, and we, uh, you know, got in touch with the girl's parents, and uh, got permission, and and uh, yep, for, gave her a credit. She has a cover gave her credit. credit. She has a publication credit. That, uh, you know, well, that's she's great. Not, she's there not, she is. And there's a picture of her in the book. Right. Abigail Carla. These poems have been written to increase the chances of Abigail having a decent life or a life at all. Oh, she's a beautiful picture. And now she's she's quite bigger than that now. Yeah. So, thank you so much for coming in to talk about Fomite Press, which is an education for me and for the viewers. And what, uh, what do you want right now and in the near future as we sign off? You mean about Fomite or yes. about life? Well, about both of them, if you want to <laughs> say that. The latter is too big. Young. Well, I think we could... Uh, you know, increase our readership. And it's hard to do that. We make gestures on social media, but we're both geezers, and we don't have a natural either aptitude or love of that, uh, that. stream. Mm -hmm. So we, we try, and uh, I, I don't know that it could get any better. In fact, it's too good. I mean, we, this is very, very oppressive success. We have 165 Published books out books, now yeah. by probably 125 different authors. And each of them have friends who they tell about how wonderful it is to work with us. right? Yeah. And their friends get in touch with us. And the, uh, the good writers have good writer friends. And so it's a, it's a tree that branches out. But guess what? It's just two people over here. So that's why the red light is on. And it probably will be on forever because even with the red light on, we can barely handle the quality and quantity of good books that are coming that submitted. So what we want is for nobody to know about us. <laughs> <laughs> Except we want people to know about the books that we already have and the books that we're about to bring out. Um, and and we, we do work pretty closely with um, Champlain and St. Michael's Colleges in particular. Good for interns. With student interns who help us with that um, kind of outreach. And Donna, what is your greatest satisfaction in, in this, in working as a publisher? Oh, I have a lot. Um, one is I love to see the final printed book because I've put a lot of work into them and they're, um, they're, they, they're usually beautiful. But secondly, I really like sending people money <laughs> when <laughs> their books sell. Um, and I get to do that twice a year. And um, nobody's getting rich off their Fomite books, but some people get a little more than a Chinese lunch. <laughs> That's good. And we can buy the books in, in various bookstores. We see them in libraries. We can buy them on Amazon. Or, yeah. or Barnes & Noble or Powell's Books. Most of our books can be special ordered by any independent bookstore. Uh, um, and we encourage people to go that route if they can. Yeah, and then, you know, and then uh, you can window shop on the website 
on our website, fomidepress.com. And if you look at our books, you can scroll through it. It still amazes me to see all the, all the books we've made, you know, yeah. some of which I can't even remember. But yeah. uh, just... Well, thank you so much for coming in. It's, it's been an amazing introduction for most of us to Fomite Books. And we will find you. And we will find you. <laughs> and we'll run. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you so much thanks. for coming in. Thanks for okay. having us. And viewers, until next time, this was a wonderful, wonderful show, an introduction to Fomite Books. Thank you for watching. And thank you, Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy. Goodbye for now. <laughs>